Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the fourth, I think, <laughs> seminar of uh, this series. And uh, thanks to join us. And today is a pleasure to have with us uh, Christophe Bernard. And um, I will introduce him uh, briefly in a few seconds. But I want only to remind you that uh, you can ask questions using the Ask a, a Question button uh, on, on the screen. And, um, and not the chat. If you have to say something, uh, uh, you can write in the chat, but if not, uh, use the Ask a Question button. And you can also vote for the question that you like. And so the, the most voted question will be the first ask again. And um, so I'm Gabriele Lignani. I <laughs> introduce myself. And, uh, and I, I co-chair this seminar with uh, Dimitri Kuhlman here. And uh, I don't know, Dimitri, if you want to add something. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. So we already have one burning question, which is, where's the cowboy hat? It's from Payman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to wear it in Marseille. <laughs> OK. So there's the answer. And uh, OK, so to introduce our, our speaker, uh, Christophe Bernardis the director of the research ESERM and is a head of the Physionet team at the Institute of the Neuroscience the Systems. Sorry for my French. And uh, he was trained in mathematics and theoretical physics and he obtained a PhD in neuroscience uh, in 1990 at the University of Paris. The, his lab is focusing on epilepsy mechanisms and, uh, associated, uh, and uh, the association with uh, comorbidities like depression and cognitive defects. And uh, also, also in, the, in his lab, uh, is developing new technologies and such as organic ele electronics for recording control is brain activity. And also the virtual mouse brain, uh, to, uh, the virtualization of individual mice to study whole brain dynamics. He received the, the Michael, uh, Michael Price on epilepsy research in 2007 and the Felix Price on innovation for the organic transistor. And uh, is a former reviewing editor of science and journal neuroscience. And probably as everybody knows, is the present uh, editor in chief of eNeuro, the open access um, journal of uh, the Society for Neuroscience. So it's a pleasure for me again to have you here. And uh, the title of this talk, but I think that you can say and uh, you can start with your talk also. Without. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, uh, first, I would like to thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, series because when I saw the list of speakers, uh, I really felt uh, honored to be uh, part of them because they are really uh, brilliant speakers uh, on this series. And I, uh, I'm waiting for the uh, uh, news to come. I really enjoyed the past ones. So I think it's going to be uh, a very, very good series of talks uh, on epilepsy. What I would like to talk uh, to you today about is uh, something which is rather new uh, for me, which is the uh, circadian and multidian uh, rhythmicity of epilepsy. And I would like to uh, present to you today a kind of um, scientific framework or a hypothesis, you can call it whatever you want, to try to ask questions. I'm not going to answer any question. I'm going to uh, provide you with a framework to ask questions to try to understand the rhythmicity of epilepsy. But before starting, I would like to pay tribute to uh, Paolo Sassone Corsi, who in fact was the uh, inspiration behind the work that I'm going to present. And uh, Paolo passed away uh, six weeks ago. And Paolo is a friend and a superstar uh, in uh, uh, circadian rhythms, in uh, epigenetics and metabolism. Just to give you an idea, uh, he authored roughly 30 papers in cell, 25 in nature, and I can't remember how many in science. So that was the kind of uh, scientist uh, Paolo was, and uh, I miss him. So first, the outline uh, 
of uh, this talk, first I will show you that there is strong uh, evidence of circadian rhythmicity in epilepsy. And uh, as a forward, I would like to insist on the fact that circadian is taken in the first sense, which means roughly one day or roughly 24 hours. It's not exactly uh, 24 hours. It's around it. it, can be 23 or 25. Then I will uh, introduce you to something that I consider truly uh, important. It was a discovery for me that circadian molecular oscillations are uh, found throughout organisms uh, on Earth. And then I will try to bind the two, these two concepts into one, which is the more hypothesis, which is molecular oscillations and rhythmicity of epilepsy. And this will serve as a backbone to try to understand the rhythmicity of epilepsy. And I will briefly touch upon the multigen rhythmicity. So multigen is not 24 hours, but it's slower, it's days. Uh, 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 rhythms that have a period of several days and also comorbidities. So let's start with the second in rhythmicity and epilepsy. Uh, if you look at old treaties, which are several thousand year, years old, you will find reference about the second in rhythmicity uh, of seizures. So this is a very old observation. Now, one of the first uh, scientific reports uh, is from London down in the Lancet in uh, 1929. And what they did was to observe uh, patients living in colony in England, and they just quantified when they had seizures. On this graph, you can see the night and day cycle, and here the distribution of seizures during the night and day cycle for all the patients. And what they found is that during the day, they could observe three peaks where seizure probability was increased and during the night, two peaks. What they discovered is that uh, most patients had one or two peaks. Different patients could have different peaks, so different uh, periods during which seizure probability was increased. But in any case, that was the first scientific report uh, of the circuit and regulation uh, of seizures by observing a larger number of individuals. Know that that was the good time when you could draw histograms with your uh, pen and your hand. Time is gone. So more recently, uh, hard evidence was obtained because to prove that you have circadian rhythmicity, you do you need to do long-term recordings, um, EEG recordings. Uh, obviously, intracranial it's even better to prove a circadian rhythmicity of seizures. <clears throat> there are two major studies, uh, one uh, from um, California with the uh, group of uh, Vikram Rao, and that was initiated by Maxim Bode, and the other uh, by the Australian group uh, by Cook and uh, uh, Philippa Caroli, who did a series of uh, brilliant papers on that. But they report basically the same type of findings. So I asked Philippa to uh, provide me some uh, data that was not in the, in the paper, and uh, here are six patients. And on this graph, you see uh, the normalized rate, just like the previous uh, uh, image, of the distribution of uh, seizures in blue. In this patient, during the night and day cycle, in this patient, you can clearly see that there is a circadian distribution of seizures because most seizures in this patient occur in the afternoon and they peak around like uh, 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. And no seizures during the night here in gray. In this other patient, seizures occur at the beginning of the night with a high probability, but also after the end uh, of the night here. So one thing that uh, we can conclude already is that yes, there is circadian rhythmicity of seizures, these blue things here in different patients, and it varies from uh, one patient to the other. Now, if we look more closely at each uh, patient, and here it's again time of the day, and here it's the number of days. So you can follow the history for each patient of when seizures, the dots, occur in, uh, in a given patient. So this is the same patient as here, and you can see that the distribution is centered around 2 or 3 p.m. Now, what is also interesting, I told you that this patient has a 
distribution of seizure that is different. But what you can also notice is that at the beginning of the recording, during like three months, seizures occur in the afternoon, but not in the morning. And then all of a sudden, during the second third of the recording time, it's nearly a year, seizures start to occur now in the morning, which was not a present before. So the other information that can be gained is that the distribution of seizures in time during the night and day cycle can change during one's life. So conclusions of all these studies and um, Philippa did also uh, a paper showing that uh, on the population of uh, 1,200 patients, there was a very strong circadian rhythmicity in most patients. I think it's 80%. So there is circadian rhythmicity. 80% again means that not all patients display that kind of thing. For example, this patient, no clear uh, circadian rhythmicity, but perhaps this is due to the fact that the patient has uh, few seizures. So there is a period of increased probability that we can call the seizure rush hour, and that would be around uh, this time. It is patient specific, as I, I showed you, and it may change during one's life. Okay, so seizures are one thing that we can observe in patients, but uh, something else that is uh, also interesting is interrectal activity. Why? Because seizures do not occur every day but interrectal spikes, they do occur every day. Now, if you look at the distribution during the night day day cycle of um, uh, epileptic spikes, in this patient, for example, you see that the peak, the maximum activity of interrectal spikes occurs around midnight and nearly nothing during the afternoon. In this patient, for example, there is nothing during the night, but it occurs during the day and it follows nicely, so the black curves, black histogram is for the spikes, nicely follows the seizure. So here, seizures and spikes are in phase. Here, they are totally out of phase. So <clears throat> relying on spikes uh, to predict seizures, for example, may work in some patients, but not others, because clearly these uh, events are totally dissociated in, in this patient. So interrectal spikes, also show second arithmicity, but their rush hour can, uh, can be different from the seizure rush hour. And this is found also in other species like in rodents. So in this seminal work from uh, Edward Trump's group, here they show that patients with mesial temporal of epilepsy have increased probability of seizures, that's this curve, during the afternoon. And what is quite amazing in a nocturnal animal, there is the same pattern. So this is a right model of temporal epilepsy and the distribution of seizures is rather similar to what we have in humans, despite the fact that their active phase is totally reversed. So it does exist in animals too. So what we would like to understand is how can we explain a seizure rush hour why don't seizures occur every day at the same time? This is quite perturbing. And why do seizures occur outside the rush hour? You may remember from the graphs that the seizures occurred indeed outside the rush hour. So it's not like a generic rule. It's just a probability. And why is the seizure rush hour patient specific? That is also a key question because we have to understand uh, what to take into account that each patient may be uh, a unique case. We have to deal with individuals. Okay, so that was for the evidence of Sergan arithmicity in epilepsy. And now I'm going to provide you with the other entry point that is necessary to get into the more hypothesis, which is molecular oscillations in organisms. Okay, so let's take a very simple organism, which is the cyanobacterium Syndecococcus elongatus, which lives uh, in the oceans. In this organism, there are, among others, three proteins with interesting properties. The protein KIAIC has the ability to autophosphorylate, 
So to add a phosphorus group on one of its um, um, sites, like here, when it's red, it, it has a phosphorus, uh, uh, sorry, a phosphorus group added. And it can dephosphorylate, auto-dephosphorylate, so remove the uh, phosphate group. But this protein has other partners. Uh, this protein, the KAIA, which increases the ability of this protein to autophosphorylate. And so when it binds to its partner, the C is going to phosphorylate and phosphorylate again because the A partner is present. And there is a third partner, which is the B partner, which has a negative effect on this, removing it. And as it is removed, then this protein starts to dephosphorylate, losing its phosphate. Uh, groups to go back to a dephosphorylated state and again it can cycle. Okay, so these are for the basic properties of this uh, three protein system. Now, what is truly amazing, you take these three proteins, the A, the B and the C, you put them into a test tube with energy in the form of ATP and this is what is happening. So this is the phosphorylated form of this protein. The empty circle is the non-phosphorylated form and the square indicates the total amount of C protein. These are three days of test tube recordings and you see that the number of protein is constant. But you can see that the phosphorylation of the protein follows a near circadian rhythm and the dephosphorylation, which is the reverse, goes in antiphase, of course. So this is, for me, amazing. You just put three proteins and some energy, and spontaneously, they will start to oscillate at a phase, at, sorry, at a period that is the rotation of the Earth. It's not surprising because life evolved in this kind of environment. In a in very simple organism, you find circadian molecular oscillators. This is a built-in mechanism. And possibly it's present in every cell, in every uh, organism uh, on Earth. Why can such a thing happen when you add just three proteins and energy? Well, this is going back to the work of uh, Ilya Prigogine, the Nobel Prize of uh, Chemistry. And he showed that <clears throat> oscillations can emerge in systems which operate far from thermodynamic equilibrium. And that living systems are the perfect example of a system operating far from thermodynamic equilibrium. And to create oscillations, you need, or it is sufficient to have feedback processes. And here the feedback process is provided by the A and B protein on the C. And with this, it's enough to trigger an oscillation. And I really recommend this uh, paper that talks about in biology of the uh, uh, how oscillations can emerge uh, from a system. Of course, uh, proteins have a half-life which is rather limited from minutes to hours or days. So the system, uh, circadian system cannot rely only on uh, protein cycling. In fact, in, uh, the, in organs, in complex or multicellular organisms, or organs and, and the brain in particular, uh, it uh, goes to the gene level, so to the transcript level. And this has been uh, identified clearly in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, a structure of the brain, uh, which controls circadian rhythmicity. I don't want to detail the mechanism, but the core mechanism is the same. It's feedback loop. And it works like this. You have like this dimer of proteins made of clock and bemol. They are controlling the transcription of genes, including these two uh, proteins, per and cry, which are produced by the action of clock and bemol. They accumulate into the cytoplasm and then they migrate to the nucleus where they have an EBIT reaction on clock and bemol one, stopping the transcription of per and cry, which then decrease and then it starts again uh, producing, once this negative uh, feedback is removed, clock and B1 kick in again, producing per and cry one. There are multiple other loops, feedback loops, uh, which are operant, 
which makes it a very complicated system. But the principle uh, that you need only to remember is that you have feedback loops which allow oscillations to be generated. The end result is that you have tens, hundreds, thousands of genes and proteins in the suprachiasmatic nucleus that evolve during the night and day cycle. They go up, they go down, they go up, and they go down. If you isolate the suprachiasmatic nucleus, it will oscillate by itself with a period that can vary between 23 and 25 hours. Light cues are used uh, for the suprachiasmatic nucleus to synchronize on a 24-hour basis the clock. But otherwise, the clock, because it's a built-in mechanism, has its own periodicity. It gets resynchronized every day. All right, so we have a clock in the brain, but not only in the brain. And I want to insist on that because we tend to be brain-centric, but all organs, I don't know whether all organs, but many organs in our body, they have also their own circadian clock. The liver has been particularly well studied and it's endogenous, which means that you isolate the liver from the rest and the clock system in the liver continue to oscillate independently from the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain. Although this one exerts a tight control the clock of the liver, but by itself, it can oscillate with the same kind of mechanism with transcription and translation loops. And all organs have these clocks, including the microbiome, our uh, resident uh, uh, microbes, symbiote. They have a periodicity of 25 hours and they release continuously with a cycling uh, uh, pattern proteins, peptides that get into the bloodstream and that can enter the brain. So the bottom line is that in all our organs, we have circuit and clock that change the state of this, their own system. And because they send like hormones or proteins or electric signal, they can communicate with each other and thus influence the arithmetic and the oscillation that are present in the other organs. So it's not only the brain that has a top-down effect controlling the oscillations of the various organs. We don't know that yet, but the organs can exert also an influence on the circadian rhythm in the brain. And the best example is the synchronization of metronomes. So you remember that there are clocks which are independent in each of the organs. So if they oscillate independently from each other, this is what happens. Now, if you link them weakly, if you couple them because they exchange proteins or electric signals, this is what's going to happen. After some time, the oscillators are going to be synchronized. We don't know whether this is really happening because this, not, this hasn't been studied yet because we don't know which are the signals uh, which are exchanged between the different organs, but it's likely that such a scheme may happen. Bottom line is that we have a body of coupled oscillators, and this is what is happening when you couple them, they get synchronized. And this may explain the rhythmicity that we see during the night and day cycle for everything. Like the lowest body temperature is early in the morning, and the highest body is late in the afternoon. And you can have the same kind of uh, circadian rhythmicity for cognitive uh, procedures, uh, efficacy, uh, or muscle efficacy. This circadian arithmicity of body functions is the result of the oscillations that occur everywhere in the body, not only in the brain. I insist on that because we don't want to think that it's all coming from the brain. And it's particularly important for seizures. Even if they come from here, there may be a strong influence from other organs, but we don't know that. So the first conclusion is that there are most um, molecular oscillators uh, may be in all organisms on Earth. They are built in. And there are uh, coupled oscillators throughout the body in complex organisms like humans. But was, what is critical to uh, remember is that the molecular landscape changes from one moment to the next because proteins go up and down. So the structure, the 
neuronal network structure is changing from one hour to the next because proteins get expressed or not expressed anymore. And this is obviously what we think that it's related to the needs of the body or the actions that it takes. And what is important, I didn't insist on that, there is a bidirectional relationship between diseases with any organ and altered oscillations. If you have a dysregulation of the circadian rhythm in one organ, that will produce a disease. And conversely, a disease in one organ results in altered circadian oscillations. Okay, so now let's go uh, to the um, brain and see what is happening in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then we'll get to epilepsy. So I remind you that in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, we have genes that go, which uh, uh, transcription goes up and down. And for these two, they are in antiphase. <clears throat> they control numerous uh, other target genes. And these target genes are going to oscillate as these ones oscillate. And as a result, the proteins are going uh, to be expressed in a different manner during the night day, day cycle. It is believed that uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the core clock of the body, and there's a lot of evidence of it. But in other brain regions, they are what are called secondary or ancillary clocks, which are controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. But what we know is that in each of these, uh, in all the regions, you have these clock genes which are oscillating. Now, whether the neuronal structure of the, archi and the molecular architecture of these uh, neuronal regions oscillate, this was not known. Only the suprachiasmatic nucleus had been investigated. And this is when I met uh, Paolo Sassanikorsi, <clears throat> and I told, when he showed that there were clock genes everywhere, I told him, but then these cortical regions should oscillate as well and change their organization during the night age cycle. He said, yeah, maybe, and nobody has uh, uh, tested it. So we decided to do it, and that's something that started uh, now uh, nine years, uh, eight years ago. But we already know that hippocampal processes, so not at the molecular level, but hippocampal processes do oscillate. We know since 1977 that circadian rhythms uh, uh, of synaptic excitability have been demonstrated. So the uh, synapse excitability also changes during the night and day cycle. LTP is changing during the night and day cycle. It's a very uh, old story as well. More recently, the MAP kinase pathway oscillates, and this is important for uh, memory. And place safe firing, more recently, has been shown to uh, oscillate in a circadian manner. So the question that we ask is, is the molecular architecture of the hippocampus also oscillating? Because if the, the, the proteins oscillate inside the hippocampus, then you may explain why you see these kind of things. The excitability is changing or the place cell firing is changing. So I want to acknowledge uh, those uh, who did the work. So the paper finally got accepted after many, 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 many years of fight. Uh, it will be published in October. And um, I want to acknowledge um, Antoine and Anton, who did all the in vivo and in vitro uh, work and generated all the animals uh, in the lab. Uh, the first, uh, the very first test were, were done in Bonn uh, by uh, Albert Becker and Susan Shaw and their team. Uh, that gave us the proof of concept. Um, Conrad and Nick, Conrad from uh, uh, Katarzyna Lukasiuk uh, lab and uh, Nick from uh, Pierre Baldi with Paolo Sansone Corsi did all the uh, transcriptomic analysis that uh, you will see. And uh, Sonia and uh, Wolfgang did very tough uh, in vivo experiment that I will show you also later. And Maxim helped us uh, for the uh, metabolic part. So what we did was to collect uh, ventral hippocampi. Why the ventral hippocampus? Because this is the uh, epileptogenic zone uh, in the model that we are using. We collected uh, the hippocampus from the uh, four mice every four hour in both control animals and uh, pilocarpine uh, 
uh, treated animal who had spontaneous seizures late in the chronic period. Okay, so now let's have a look at what is happening in the uh, control hippocampus. This is a list of genes, okay? And here is the p-value indicating that the transcript is oscillating uh, with a high probability. <clears throat> and this is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the cerebellum, the brainstem, and the hypothalamus. In green are highlighted uh, classic clock genes, and you can see that these genes oscillate in the hippocampus, but also in these other brain regions. Nothing is surprising because this is like a ubiquitous uh, mechanism of clock genes uh, oscillating in uh, different brain regions. <clears throat> so you can see that there are many transcripts which are oscillating uh, in the hippocampus. And we stopped here, the list is uh, much longer. But what you can see, for example, here, is that these two genes, which are strongly oscillating in the control hippocampus, do not oscillate at all in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the cerebellum, the brainstem, and the, uh, and the hypothalamus, which means that the oscillation of uh, transcripts is brain region specific. What we found is that 10% of the transcripts are oscillating in the control ventral hippocampus as compared to 90% in the suprachiasmatic nucleus and 6% in the forebrain. So this kind of study has many caveats, of course, because we mix up every cell type found in the ventral hippocampus, so including glial cell, erythrocytes, uh, pericytes, whatever. So there is a lot of noise generated, and I think that the 10% uh, oscillation of value is a serious underestimate of the number of transcripts uh, that are oscillating. We confirmed it with RT-PCR, we did a proteomic uh, study, and we found the same percentage of 10% of proteins oscillating in the control uh, hippocampus. So I think that this is also a key aspect to consider when you do brain modeling. If you do brain modeling and you model a network with a fixed molecular architecture, okay, it will model maybe some, something that happens at 2.35 a.m. But if you don't take into account the fact that the molecular architecture is uh, changing from one hour to the next, maybe the process that you are uh, trying to study, for example, a seizure, which may occur in the afternoon, should be modeled in the context of the organization of this structure at, uh, in the afternoon and not in the morning. So I think this is a key uh, also to, uh, it, it's making our life more complicated, but this is very important to consider. So I told you that uh, this is an, uh, we think that this is an underestimate. And while this um, uh, paper was being stuck by reviewers, uh, we got scooped, uh, at least for the control study, by these two beautiful science papers, but they did much better work than we did. Um, and they found, using now the whole forebrain, so they mix here every brain region, but they collected only uh, the uh, synaptosomes to investigate the transcriptome, the proteome, and the phosphorylum of uh, the synaptosomes. So again, they mixed up uh, all synapses, but what they found is that 70% of the transcriptome is oscillating. This is huge. And again, this is another estimate because they mix all brain regions, and I showed you that uh, the oscillations are brain region dependent, and they mix up uh, different cell types, which should add a lot of noise. So <clears throat> what I think is that maybe up to 90% of the proteins and the transcripts are oscillating in a given brain region uh, uh, during the circadian rhythm, the, during the night and day cycle. Okay, so now what is happening in epilepsy? So here is the number of genes, uh, the transcripts, sorry, that are oscillating in a certain manner in the control animal, so roughly 1,200. Now in epilepsy, we have 30% more genes, uh, transcripts which are oscillating, and what is remarkable is most of them we are not oscillating in the control condition. In fact, a small number compared to the uh, overall number is oscillating in both control and epilepsy conditions. And what we found is that many of these genes which are still oscillating in both control and epileptic animals, they are in antiphase. So with what we are dealing in epilepsy 
is with a total different molecular system. The molecular organization in epilepsy is totally different and it is cycling in a totally different manner as compared to the control. And I will come back uh, to this. So conclusions here so far is that the molecular architect architecture of the hippocampus is cycling in control animals, okay? And the cycling rules are different in the experimental temporal epilepsy, at least in this model that we have been using. And that raises some problems for data interpretation. I will show you one example. And I will show you some kind of examples of functional consequences <clears throat> of these differences between control and epilepsy. Now, data interpretation. We all love um, GABAergic neurotransmission in epilepsy because uh, we think that uh, there's something wrong with it and that explains uh, seizures. And there are many papers looking at the expression level of some subunits. Okay, so let's take the uh, alpha-3 subunit of the GABA A receptor. So this is a uh, time of the day when we collected the tissue. And this is the expression pattern of the uh, alpha-3 subunit during the night and day cycle in control animals and in epileptic animals. You can see right away that these transcripts are oscillating in both conditions, but the pattern is quite different. Now, if you do an experiment at 11 a.m., you sacrifice the animal, you collect the ventral hippocampus, you do RT-PCR, and you measure the transcript level or the protein level, you will see that, and it's significant, that there is an upregulation of the alpha-3 subunit. But if you wait and you do the experiment in the afternoon, you have a down regulation. So what can you conclude? You cannot conclude anything. It all depends upon the time of the day when you do the experiment. Sometimes during the day it's upregulated, sometimes it is downregulated. So I think maybe we should consider reinterpreting many data uh, obtained with RTPCR or Western blood because clearly some result may be time of the day dependent. And it's impossible to conclude in a general fashion that this subunit is down or upregulated because it depends on when you do the experiment. Okay, so this is for the caveats. Now, what, the, what about functional consequences? Sonia in uh, uh, Wolfgang's lab did uh, the heroic experiments injecting PTZ to trigger seizures in control and uh, epileptic mice. And I just want to, you to look at this result. This is the uh, amount of PTZ that you need to inject to trigger a seizure in the animal. At 11.30 a.m., the control animals are more susceptible. You need less drug to inject to trigger a seizure. The epileptic animals are more resistant. But at 11.30 p.m. now, it's reversed. The control animals are more resistant and the pilo animals, the epileptic animals, are more sensitive. This shows you that despite the fact that PTZ is going to target the same uh, proteins and same systems, they are going to react totally differently in control and epilepsy. This shows you in a uh, global way that the two systems are really different and it's very difficult to compare them because it depends again upon the time of the day. And this is like a macroscopic measurement of what is happening. We did also uh, metabolic activity because metabolism is, of course, the core thing in living organisms. And we looked at um, oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis <coughs> in control slices obtained uh, in the morning or in the afternoon. That's a side giver uh, that indicates how many hours after you switch on the light in the animal facility. In control and epileptic animals, control and epilepsy at different times. So in controls in the ventral hippocampus, there is nearly no difference between oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis uh, at the two time points. Now, in epilepsy, you can clearly see that there is hypometabolism as compared to control, but only in the morning. In the afternoon, the metabolic activity is quite uh, close to the control situation. But here, in epilepsy, the system relies on oxidative phosphorylation in the morning and strongly on glycolysis in the afternoon. 
This shows that energy metabolism in epilepsy is really different in the ventral hippocampus as compared to the control situation. And this fits this time with the uh, highest probability of seizures occurring in these mice. So here we do EG recordings of the mice, and this is the distribution of uh, seizures uh, across the night and the cycle. And as is in humans, uh, you see that the peak of uh, seizures occur in the afternoon. So conclusions regarding this part is that the molecular, but also the functional architecture is not the same from one hour to the next in the control, but also uh, in epilepsy. And maybe this is valid for other brain regions which have not been investigated yet. And in epilepsy, I insist on that the pattern, the molecular oscillation is totally different. It's a different system. So this may be key for treatments because you need to study epilepsy for itself and take into account the, the oscillating molecular architecture to target at the proper time uh, some uh, proteins or system or communication system. And I would like to ask this question, is it valid to compare epilepsy and control animals? If in epilepsy we are dealing with a different system, maybe it should be it should be studied for itself. And this reprogramming, if you want to call it that way, of the second uh, molecular architecture of the hippocampus in epilepsy may also occur in other disorders, in depression, in uh, schizophrenia, in autism. This has been demonstrated in peripheral organs. Diseases are linked to a reprogramming of the clock. So maybe this also happens for other disorders in uh, different brain regions. Okay, so now let's try to put that together, these molecular oscillations and the circadian rhythmicity into the more hypothesis. Well, that's very simple. I mean, there's nothing really brilliant about it. It's just added one and one. So what we found in the hippocampus is the following picture. This is an invented scheme, right? Uh, it's, it's not the reality. Let's say that in the morning, in this pyramidal cell, at this synapse, there are four receptors, okay? In the glial cell, which is here, energy production does not rely on oxidative phosphorylation because the amount of ATP produced by mitochondria is very low. In the nucleus, of the pyramidal cell, there is a lot of transcription of an FKPB, okay? And if you look at what the network is doing, it's firing at a low frequency. Now in the afternoon, because the molecular organization is totally different, not only in the brain, but also in other brain, uh, sorry, in the hippocampus, but in other brain regions and other organs, this is the picture that you get because the molecular landscape has changed. Now you have only two receptors here, now the glial cell is making a lot of ATP with the oxidative phosphorylation. And FKPB transcription occurs at a very low rate and holding below through the BBB, there are some peptides coming from the gut, which are going to influence the activity of this hippocampal network. And the result of all this is that then the cells are firing at a higher frequency in the afternoon. So this is basically the scheme, which is very simple. Maybe what we see is that the network activity is oscillating during the night and day cycle. This is night, this is day. And here is the seizure threshold. And periodically, we get close to the seizure threshold. But again, seizures do not occur every day at the same time. You need something else to happen. And when this something else to happen happens, like stress or lack of sleep, then you cross the threshold. But when the, the probability is high, when the system is close to the threshold. And this is uh, what I call the uh, more hypothesis, the molecular association to explain the rhythmicity of epilepsy. <clears throat> it's just based on the simple observation that the molecular architecture of neuronal networks is oscillating. Of course, this gives you a wrong idea that the seizure threshold doesn't change. Obviously, the seizure threshold is likely to change also in the circadian manner. But the idea is that networks periodically move close to the seizure threshold, and that may explain the seizure rush hour. But again, this is not sufficient. You need additional factors to cross the threshold. And in epilepsy, we know 
uh, it's a recent paper that there are some molecules which oscillate in the circulating matter. And this has been shown for glutamate in the epileptogenic networks that there is a second like rhythmicity in glutamate, which fits perfectly with this framework. So maybe future research should be devoted to what brings networks close to the seizure threshold at regular uh, time intervals. So the conclusion is uh, here that the molecular oscillations provide sufficient conditions for the circadian rhythmicity of seizures, but they are not enough. You need something else. You need something else for seizure crossing. And we don't know what that is because seizures do not occur every day. And how can we explain that uh, there are also seizures occurring outside the rush hour? Well, we know that there are many paths to seizures and we studied that. And maybe certain paths are facilitated at a given time point during the circadian, the, during the night and day cycle, and other paths are facilitated during different times, which offers the possibility to have different seizure rush hours. In addition, if you receive a strong enough input, then the system can drive, the, the system can be driven to seizure threshold no matter what, independent from uh, the change in the molecular architecture, like a highly stressful event, for example. And brain region may oscillate differently within and across patients. And that could explain inter and intra-individual variability. I showed you that the molecular architecture, uh, which is cycling, is different in the cerebellum and the hippocampus. So if the cerebellum would, uh, could generate uh, seizures, then you would have a different uh, seizure rush hour in patients for whom the seizure would originate from the cerebellum as compared to those uh, originating from the cerebellum because <clears throat> the rules are different in different brain regions. And finally, yes, I have uh, just two slides to show you. Uh, I want to just briefly touch upon the multigen rhythmicity because this is related to that. I showed you that seizures have a uh, circadian regulation, <clears throat> but recently, um, with long-term recordings, thanks to the uh, NeuroPACE trial and the NeuroVista trial, so in, again in Australia and then California, <clears throat> we could, well, they could measure uh, interictal spikes and seizure during years, even decades in some patients. So here it's in a human recording, and in gray it's the uh, interictal activity that has clear circadian uh, component, and that's every day. But you can see that there is an envelope, and the peak of interictal activity every day increases and then decreases and then increases again and then decreases again. And this makes a slow rhythmic activity that can be anything between seven and 40 days in patients recording during a long time. So if you draw this slow curve, this multi rhythm, what they have found is that seizures mostly occur on the rising phase of this slow oscillation. And the same results were found in dogs. And with Maxim, we found the same thing in rats in two experimental models of uh, epilepsy. The good thing in uh, rats is that the rhythmicity is between five and seven days, which makes it uh, easy uh, to uh, study. But you need at least six weeks of recordings. And again, this, the interictal activity has a slow component and seizures occur on the rising phase of this slow rhythm. So this adds another uh, degree of complexity because we have to take into account not only the circadian rhythm, but also the multidian rhythm. And we have no idea where this is coming from. There are some anecdotal uh, papers that you cannot find on PubMed, but you can find them on uh, ResearchGate, which describe that cortisol, saliva cortisol, has a multidian rhythmicity uh, in humans. So this is a kind of evidence, although this should be reproduced, uh, that there are slow rhythms 
in humans, at least at the molecular level. So this is going to make our life more complicated because uh, the cortisol experiment was done on uh, healthy humans. So it looks like we have, in addition to the circadian rhythm, slower rhythms in our body that change the properties of the system. But this fits well in the more hypothesis. Now imagine this, you live uh, close to the ocean and every day you have the tide, two tides. At low tide, you are uh, the, the sea is far uh, from the street. And let's say that a seizure is, that is when your house, which is close to the street, gets flooded. But at high tide, which occurs in a, a regular manner, like the second rhythm, water rises but remains far from the street. Now, as you get close to the equinox tide, the water is going to rise and rise and rise and rise, just like the meridian rhythm. And you may have a seizure and your house gets flooded, but you need another condition. And the condition is like a strong wind coming from the sea or uh, a full moon or a storm or anything. Because usually at the equinox, if the weather is calm, nothing happens. So you need additional mechanisms for your house to get flooded. And to explain why house, uh, seizures occur outside the rush hour, well, your house can get flooded if there is a hurricane, and even if it's low tide, you'll get flooded. So the more hypothesis also takes into account uh, this kind of property. And also the comorbidities are also, uh, they are regulated in a certain manner. We know that in patients with depression, there is a clear uh, circadian component to depression in patients. We don't know in epilepsy, whether cognitive deficits and depression are regulated in a certain manner, but that could be also a possibility because these emerge from the molecular uh, architecture of the network. I will skip this. Jump to the final conclusion that the second rhythmicity of seizures and interictal spike that I showed you is grounded in fact in the basic properties of life on Earth with these built-in molecular oscillators. And the oscillations that are present in the entire body for us and mammals, they may play a role because everything is coupled to everything. So when we study second rhythms in epilepsy or multidian, we don't want to forget what is happening in the periphery because what we are looking for to explain the rhythmicity may lie there and not in the brain. So these molecular oscillations can give us cues to understand how to control seizure probability, because if you know that the seizure probability increases, then maybe you only have to act during that time. And also you can time drug treatments. And finally, maybe we should revise the way we study uh, neurological disorders, because we always compare a control tissue with a tissue obtained in a disease model. But if these have nothing to do with each other in the way they operate, there's no point in comparing them. No gain. Well, some understanding, but we have to study the disease for itself, not in comparison with control. Well, that's uh, my argument. Now you'll end up with this very important message. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Christophe. Uh, truly inspiring, and uh, also thanks to make my future transcriptomics experiment more difficult, more complicated. And uh, if if uh, someone wants to ask wants to ask any questions, please use the ask a question button. And so, Christophe, can I get in there? Um, uh, so that's a terrific talk. Thank you very much. Very very interesting. Lots of things to think about. Uh, you have considered the direction of causality from sleep to circadian rhythms of epilepsy or, or susceptibility to seizures. Um, epilepsy itself uh, is very likely to disturb sleep-wake patterns in patients and also probably in the rodent models. So I was just wondering if that could potentially be an explanation 
uh, for some of the, for instance, the phase switching that Philippa Caroli's data suggested. Um, and I just wondered what your what your thoughts are about about this uh, potential compound. Well, that's that's a key question. Thank you for uh, asking it. Um, it is true that, <clears throat> for example, if you affect sleep, you will affect the circadian rhythm. But <clears throat> this is my point, and uh, uh, the uh, papers from uh, Golberter, the student of Prigozhin, are really inspiring. In such a system, the oscillations emerge. It's a complex system, so they emerge from the system. And I would argue that there is no more causality in here because everything is coupled to everything. So all the observation that you get emerge from this and you lose causality in that case. Of course, if you perturb in one direction something, you may see a relaxation and an effect on another thing. And, but it's not causality as we think. Uh, it's, it's another way to think about how biology works. But that, that's the direction I'm taking now. It's just, I'm, I'm trying to understand the emergent properties and not direct causality. I do this and it produces that. It's all coming together. You have sleep disruption, you have um, alteration in the clock, but it's all together. It's the same thing manifesting itself. Thank you. We have a few questions. At the moment, two questions. One from Annalisa Shimemi, and she asks, she says thanks for the provoking talk, and uh, she asks if, uh, do you know how your seizure susceptibility changes in arrhythmic mice? No. Okay. And um, second question is from Kimberly Whitehead. And she asks, uh, have, have any of these findings been looked at uh, in uh, pediatric populations, either humans or animal models? Do they show the same uh, circadian and uh, multidian patterns? So this is a fascinating question. So I'm not aware of any uh, human data uh, in the pediat pediatric uh, population. Um, regarding, uh, so there are multiple papers on the, the, the development of uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the development of uh, circadian rhythms. <clears throat> so there is a developmental profile, but this is uh, uh, now open space. I mean, uh, you can clearly see uh, that this is a new field of research. These two science papers uh, that uh, which were published last year, they're opening a new field of research. And it's good because uh, it allows young scientists to uh, jump into that because there is everything to discover again when you have to take into account uh, uh, the time of the day based on the molecular architecture of your system, which is different. For example, how can you explain in the hippocampus that you learn better in the afternoon than in the morning? Why? What are the molecular determinants? Same thing for epilepsy. <clears throat> It took us a huge amount of uh, years to publish this thing that is not published yet. It's uh, in press. So, of course, this is just the beginning. But now uh, people should investigate what is happening in uh, uh, developmental epilepsy, in genetic models, uh, in the aging population, uh, in association with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Everything, uh, the, the field is all open. And it's good makes our life more complicated, but it's yeah. it's amazing. When I found out this, you put three molecules in a test tube and they start to oscillate at 24 hours, I said, wow, life is beautiful. <laughs> life on Earth is just marvelous. And imagine on Mars, it's, it's not the same periodicity. So life would be organized differently with different molecular oscillators if there, are, if there is life there. Very fascinating. Thanks, uh, Christophe. We have another two questions for now. One from Julie Lee that asks, uh, would this finding also suggest that certain populations are more vulnerable, are more vulnerable to seizures than others, like night shift workers? Okay, so yes, uh, intuitively, <clears throat> 
if you start to perturb uh, the uh, circadian rhythm, you may uh, favor or increase the uh, probability to have a seizure because you're going to change the way the, the molecular architecture is changing your, in your system. So it's like a stress factor that pushes the system uh, closer to a seizure threshold with a very simplistic scheme that I propose. Again, the, the, the hypothesis I propose is just a, a framework to ask questions, not to, I'm, I'm not here to answer questions, but this is just to give an idea of what is happening and, and how you can study now the system. So yes, night shift workers, that's a very good example where something that alters the circadian rhythm may have consequences uh, on seizure probability. Okay, thanks. And we have a, a question from uh, Felix Chan that asks, uh, if you think that the molecular reprogramming of the functional transcripts, like metabolism or uh, garbage transmission, are driven by the change in oscillation of molecular circadian oscillators after the epileptic insult? Oh, so if the question is if there is a reprogramming just after uh, the status epilepticus? Yes, after the epileptic insult, yeah. I think that is means in uh, after the uh, status epilepticus, I think. I don't know. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, in fact, that's, again, uh, I mean, young people could jump on all these projects because they are highly promising. So that's a very good question. When you have the, the original brain insult, does it reprogram instantaneously all these clock machinery? Or is it a progressive event that takes time? And only when it's stabilized, then you start to have spontaneous seizures. I don't know, and I have absolutely no intuition. What is interesting is that uh, in animal models where it was looked, uh, they're not so much in terms of damage in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So the master controlling uh, controller does not appear too much affected, but the measurements were rough, rough in terms of histology. So maybe it's dramatically altered, but we don't know. This is this remains to be studied. And when it occurs during epileptogenesis, that's also a fantastic question to ask. Thanks, Christoph. And I, I have a very quick question. So that is on, on the last point that uh, you said basically that we should not use healthy animals to compare with epileptic animals if we want to understand uh, epilepsy because of this rhythmicity. But for example, if you want to understand at the level of transcriptomic, if there are changes, how you are you are you plan to do it, how you can do it in a, without comparing to an healthy animal? Sorry, what I meant is that we shouldn't do it the way we do it now. Yeah, and I've been doing it. For example, uh, at some point we were looking at uh, NRSF, uh, this uh, transcription factor. Well, it turns out that it's not regulated in a certain manner in control and in epilepsy. So when we say there is a change in regulation, then it's it's valid for all time points. So that's safe. But like for the uh, uh, GABA receptor subunit, if you find it, if you find that it's downregulated at 11 a.m. and upregulated at 3 p.m., what do you conclude? You cannot conclude it's down or upregulated. It's neither. It's just modified. So what I'm saying is that when we kill animals and uh, we study a phenomenon, could be in vivo recordings as well. Even in vivo recordings, for example, we, we look at uh, place cell stability. So something that uh, 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 Pepe Langsantini beautifully showed with uh, Greg Holmes. So in pilo animals, uh, the uh, place cell stability is decreased, okay? Maybe it is decreased at, let's say, 2 p.m. when they do the experiment as compared to the control. But then if they would have done, I'm inventing at 9 uh, p.m. the experiment, they are not that stable in the control animal and super stable in the epileptic animals. This is the kind of question that we have to ask ourselves. So when we try to just compare control and epilepsy, it can be done, but we want to be sure that there is no oscillation 
component in it. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to conclude that it's up or down if it goes uh, in antiphase, for example. Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you, Christoph. That was terrific. And um, so just to remind people, this is happening twice a month, but because it happens on the first and third Wednesdays of each month, uh, it falls on the 7th of October next time, which is actually in three weeks' time, when Jeff Nobles will be giving a talk entitled Sparks, Flames and Inferno, Epileptogenesis in the Glioblastoma Environment. So I hope to see you all there. And, uh, and with that, we'll, we'll sign off. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for inviting me.